Our next speaker is Professor Zach Tatlock from the University of Washington. He's been leading a, a very interesting group for several years now that works on trying to make floating point a little safer for people who are not numerical analysts to use. And he's approached it from quite a number of directions. Uh, and they, when they saw posits, of course, they said, hey, let's incorporate this. And it hasn't broken their system yet. But uh, let's see if you can get through 100 slides in 50 minutes. <laughs> oh, oh, I think it's like 130. So. Okay, so we'll, we'll get to it. Uh, first off, I wanted to acknowledge that the, the work I'm talking about has uh, been uh, carried out by a large and growing group of people, always excited to make new friends and collaborate with more folks, um, and just want to acknowledge all of their contributions to this work. So, um, you know, Floating Point has been this wild success in a lot of ways. I think that uh, it's, worth, it's worth acknowledging this because everybody <laughs> for the whole conference is going to rip on it uh, the rest of the time. But uh, it does give you this huge dynamic range, which is useful. Uh, it's pretty cheap. So it looks like here that around the year 2012, floating point performance became free. But actually, there's just some kind of power law going on. Um, but it keeps, it keeps dropping. And uh, individual operations give you pretty good accuracy, right? So in floating point, the way to think about it, as everybody here knows, I'm sure, is that a floating point op uh, is basically as if you did an individual operation on the reels and then round it. And so uh, for individual operations, you get this nice accuracy guarantee with the performance and the flexibility. That's pretty sweet. Uh, and the consequence is that people use floating point throughout infrastructure, right? So everything from healthcare to communications to uh, financial markets to space exploration, we see floating point being used. And that's because most of the time, uh, it's not just the individual operations that are pretty accurate, but even sequences, long sequences of these operations are accurate. So reels and floats are pretty close. Uh, the problem is when that doesn't happen. Now, in this room, we have several scientists. We have, you know, uh, astrophysicists, uh, and we have climate scientists who are fluent in numerical methods. But we don't really want all of our scientists to have to sit down and learn the nitty gritty of how to, you know, use numerics correctly. There have been a bunch of examples where these things don't go wrong. So we have financial regulations in Europe that dictate when and how you can use uh, different number systems. There have been a bunch of scientific articles retracted. Um, and, you know, there have been other kinds of disasters like uh, distortion of election results, for example. So I want to look at a couple of examples of uh, some of our friends who struggle with rounding error. So this is Harley Montgomery. Uh, he's a machine learning researcher. And he was trying to write a uh, clustering routine. And uh, when, he, when he first wrote it, he got this clustering here, which basically put every item in its own bucket. Now, as a clustering technique, it's not very useful if you just say, every object is in its own cluster, right? So what was going on? Like, what was, you know, blocking Harley? Uh, so we started talking to him, and it turned out that uh, he, was, he had this expression buried deep in his C++ code, and he was getting these divide by zero errors that were preventing his code from even running. Uh, and so after using some of the, the tools I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, later in this presentation, uh, we're able to, to rewrite it, and he got a really nice clustering, right? Now, I would like to live in a world where Harley didn't have to come knock on our lab door, uh, after spending a week banging his head on this code, right? It would be really nice if you could have pushed a button and gotten this same kind of change automatically. As another example, our friend uh, Blake here is a CAD engineer, and he was designing these interlocking rings that he's going to machine uh, to fit together, right? So this is for a significant other. The problem was that when he went to actually generate the G code to machine these things, he got really bad rounding error. So you can see that in the banding and stippling here on the left, right? And again, right? You know, Blake wants to worry about 3D geometry and design. He wants to worry about the aesthetics. He doesn't want to worry about how to fix that rounding error. So I'd really like to live in a world where Blake can just push a button and uh, address the rounding error automatically and get back code that allows him to do what he's interested in doing, right? Rather than struggling with the numerics. Um, now, it turns out that actually the, the, the same problem we helped Blake with, we've seen a few times. Another place we saw it was uh, in the computation of the complex square root in a JavaScript math library which had really bad rounding error. And so using the, the tools that I'm going to talk about in this presentation, we were able to generate a patch that was accepted and incorporated into that math library. Then we also uh, had an example where we had a plotter written in C to plot functions, uh, complex functions. And uh, ideally, you know, we expect when we plot a smooth function to get a nice, smooth, continuous plot. Unfortunately, in the naive version that uh, we encountered in this C plotter, we got some really bad uh, stippling. Right? So we're going to come back to this uh, a few times, this example, and sort of boil it down and think about what sorts of tools we need to help users address these challenges by just pressing a button. Um, but first I want to think about what's available to people today. 
So the most common approach for dealing with rounding error is to play whack-a-mole, right? Uh, you're not a numerical methods expert. As we heard earlier, it was popular in the 60s. A lot of universities don't even have a numerical methods class anymore that's required or even available sometimes. And so what people do is they, they see they're getting a weird answer. They've heard maybe they're not supposed to directly compare floating point numbers, or maybe they should be careful with subtraction. And so they go sort of futz with their code until that particular bad behavior stops showing up. But they have no idea if in doing that they're just masking it or causing some other input to go off the rails, right? Instead of playing whack-a-mole, uh, people could use a library like MPFR, which we've talked about, heard about in a few different talks so far today. So MPFR is great. It guarantees uh, correct rounding and allows you to use very large precision. Unfortunately, it's not very fast. So a lot of times you're talking about, you know, uh, up to like 100, 500 times slower. So that's uh, a non-starter for a lot of applications. It just won't be fast enough. The last option is to go to the library, hit the stacks, dust off some old tomes, and actually learn some numerical methods. And this is great because you can write high-performance accurate code. Uh, you know, if you look at things like LibM implementations or Jonathan Shuchuk's Triangle Library. So if you're a genius and you're willing to sweat, you, you can get the best of both worlds, but it's really hard. And the whole point was that we don't want scientists to have to go become numerical methods experts in order to, you know, get their job done. So what we've been working toward, is, as John mentioned, is trying to figure out what set of tools might allow us to realize that vision. And we've attacked it from a lot of different sides. And today I want to talk about four of our projects that are trying to help uh, make numerics easier to use for sort of normal programmers with sort of scare quotes around that. So I'm going to start off talking about herb grind. And uh, this is a, a dynamic analysis technique to try to identify the root cause of bad numerical error in a large application. So let's go back to our uh, plotter example here. So you know, if I'm a user, what's going to happen is I'm just going to see this bad output. And I need to figure out what, what do I need to change in my C program to get the smooth output that I actually want. And there's a lot of places that error could occur. Right? It could be in uh, the way I'm getting inputs, it could be in the way I'm sampling, it could be in the actual computation of the function, uh, on and on and on. So I want to figure out how to localize this. Um, and in this case, you know, it turns out that we're really going to be focusing primarily on the numerics. There are other things you have to, to validate, but this is a place where we, you know, floating point error or whatever other number system you're using is going to get you. In this case, what's going on is that uh, this computation, which uses the complex root, is inaccurate. And if you sort of boil it down, eventually you figure out that, uh, conveniently, the issue is trying to solve quadratic on some input where it misbehaves. In particular, uh, it's in the case where we have uh, positive b. Um, and in order to help the user figure out what they need to change about this computation to fix the plot, we need a few different things. We need to figure out uh, that this computation of the root is actually where the error is. We need to know what sub-expression in the program is responsible for introducing that error. We also want to know what inputs it's happening on. Because a lot of times, to get accurate code, it depends on the input regime you're operating in, right? OK, so that's what we want to do. We want to take the plotter, somehow figure out this information. But that's a hard problem. It's hard because it turns out that there's a lot of instructions, there's a lot of operations that programs execute. In this case, where the error actually shows up is sort of at the very end, right, when we're producing the, the color values to plot to the screen. Right? This is when we convert from floating point to end. But of course, that's at the end of a long sequence of computations. And there's all sorts of floating point operations throughout the program that have error. Only some of them matter, right? And uh, individual operations error might not be sort of that operation's fault. It can depend on inaccurately computed values from previous parts of the program. So what we want to do is figure out how to extract the root cause of things like the stippling and banding in the plot from you know, arbitrary assembly programs. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna show the output from this tool, Herbgrind, and we'll go through sort of step by step and see how Herbgrind constructs that information. So what we're gonna get is we're gonna get a location in the program where uh, error was observed in an output. So this is typically a place where you're printing a value or you're converting to an integer or you're uh, making a branch decision on some floating point value. And what I wanna know is uh, what expression caused that output to go wrong, right? So where in my source do I need to make changes so that at the output, I'll actually get an accurate answer? And I also want to know what range of inputs I saw the error on, uh, which often gives me a hint for what sorts of changes I need to make in the source to address that problem. 
So we've got four pieces. Uh, let's go through and see how Herbguide finds all of these for the program. So if we look at the, the source code, right, it's this long sequence of assembly instructions. Um, here is, it's shown in x86. I'm gonna abstract this a little bit just to make it easier to look at. You can basically think about it as, you know, we've got a bunch of ops that take operands, store it back in some register. Um, also potentially go through memory, et cetera, et cetera. And what we're gonna do is for every individual instruction that gets executed, we're gonna save some extra information. So we're gonna do a dynamic analysis. Uh, in particular, you know, whenever I run, for example, a subtraction instruction, I'm going to keep in shadow memory uh, additional values that are stored at high precision. So for, you know, if I'm doing some operation, maybe I got zero, hard to know if that's actually the correct answer or if I had some kind of catastrophic cancellation. On the side, for every floating point value in the program, I'm gonna keep a high precision MPFR shadow value. And then what I can do is I can keep around some gold standard answer, which lets me know whether or not the answer that was computed uh, in float is, is accurate. And this way I can actually tell, with just this analysis alone, I can tell if the outputs are accurate. Um, because whenever some value is converted to int, or I, make a, I take a branch on some floating point value, or I print it, I can compare what MPVAR says the value should be from what it actually was dynamically. So that let me, lets me figure out where error is showing up in the output. But it doesn't let me tell the programmer what they might need to change about their program to reduce that error. So how do we get the rest of this information? Well, what I also want to do is track uh, how error from individual operations influences those outputs. And to do that, what I'm gonna do is uh, compute what we call local error. So this is not a value that the program would normally compute on its own. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with the highly accurate MPFR values, right? So this is sort of our, our ground truth, uh, gold standard, roughly, you know, approximately. It's like 1,000 bits, so it's pretty good uh, for what the program ought to do. Now I'm gonna round those good operands down to flow. I'm gonna apply the operation to those rounded results. So notice those values in the top left-hand corner would never actually, in general, not actually occur during normal program execution. Now that's gonna give me some answer, and I'm gonna compare that to doing the same operation on the uh, ground truth results. And now I can compare the value in the bottom left with the, the value in the bottom right. And if they are significantly different, uh, what that means is that this operation is responsible for amplifying error in the program, right? It means that even when given, uh, you know, accurate inputs, it still introduced error. So in the case, suppose that this subtraction had a high local error, we would flag that instruction as being likely to have introduced error in the output. Now, each operand will also carry with it its sources of error, right? And that will sort of... Uh, get gathered up as the program executes. So for every instruction, sorry, for every value, we'll know the instructions that contributed to uh, its rounding error. Okay, so uh, this lets us figure out which operations were responsible for introducing error into an output. Uh, but we also wanna hand back to the programmer not some list of addresses in the decompiled uh, you know, assembly file from their application, but actually like to give them some expression that they can look at and have some intuition for how to improve. And so for that, we're additionally going to track for every operand and every result, it's uh, you know, a symbolic representation of that computation. So you know, here, suppose that I know that uh, whatever's in register four corresponds to square root of some other expression, whatever's in register two corresponds to the difference of two other expressions. Well, now I know that the result I'm gonna store into four corresponds to an expression which is the difference of those expressions. So we're gonna symbolically track uh, you know, the computation for you know, every operation so we, we know at a high level how that value was generated. Now remember, we're doing this for every single assembly instruction. So this should start to make you nervous. But we'll talk about some tricks in a little bit. And then the last thing I wanna know is this input regime. So I wanna know you know, for that expression, at that location in the source, what were the inputs where error occurred that contributed to getting an inaccurate output from the whole program? Uh, and so for that, we're just gonna track ranges of values uh, that we see flowing into the operands for every instruction, and uh, we can sort of gather those incrementally to get some range for the expression that uh, was responsible for introducing error. Okay, so once we have all these things, we're actually in a, a much better position to address uh, the rounding error in the application. So here I wanna show a quick example of this tool, Herbgrind, 
actually doing that. So we have a video uh, that uh, one of my students, Pavel, recorded. Unfortunately, he's been very busy. He's on the John record right now. He didn't have a chance to re-record. So there's uh, a slight mislabeling in the terminal. But here we have uh, an example of the uh, quadratic equation. We're going to run it with fixed a and c and b ranging from uh, 1 to the minus 10 up to 1 to the 10, roughly. And if we compile this with the C compiler in the sort of normal way and run it, we see that there's some funky stuff going on, right? We get a bunch of NANDs. And also, at the high end, we go from you know, 5, 6, 7, 8, and all of a sudden we start getting zeros. So if you're a user, this is uh, a pretty, you know, this isn't quite as visually arresting as the plotter, but you can see something weird's going on. So what we're going to do is run uh, this same program under Herbgrind. And when we do, it's going to spit out uh, exactly the expression responsible for introducing the error. Now in this case, this is a, a small toy example just to show a, a demo on a slide, um, but we've actually run this on uh, much larger applications, which we'll see in just a second. Here Pavel is just going through and showing uh, some pieces of the output that correspond to what we saw on the previous slide. We're going to get uh, an S expression, like JSON, right? Uh, some interchange format that it's basically like JSON. Uh, that shows the expression where the error occurred. It's also going to give us some statistics on uh, how inaccurate that was and location in the source uh, where this error sort of showed up in an output. So we're going to uh, come back to this, right? So, so far, all we've done with Herbrind is tell the user where in their application they need to look. Like we've told them how much error they have in their output and what part of their program was responsible for increasing that output. And we did it by keeping a bunch of information about every single instruction we executed, right? So we'll come back to what to do with this uh, a little bit later in the talk. So we implemented this uh, building on Valgrind, that's why it's called Herbrind, um, and we did a bunch of tricks to actually make this work in practice. So where you really want a tool like Herbrind is not when you're working on a 10 line, uh, you know, version of quadratic, or honestly even a small, simple, complex function plotter. Where you really want it is in a tool like Gromax. So Gromax, uh, does uh, chemical dynamics. It's used in drug discovery and uh, other applications. And so it's simulating the way molecules uh, interact and bind with proteins and other biological stuff that I, I don't know that much about. Um, what I do know is that it's 40,000 lines of code. So if you get an output that you don't expect, it's really not clear where you should go look to address that problem. So our goal is to be able to apply Herbrine to uh, code bases like Gromax and have it not be too slow. And to do that, we had to implement a bunch of tricks. One of the things is that those symbolic expressions that we compute for each value, uh, we have to bound the depth of those, right? So we need to maintain enough context that it's still useful for the user when they're trying to change a computation to uh, you know, improve the accuracy um, without making the overhead of tracking that data too high. And we also do a bunch of stuff like type analysis, so we don't have any overhead on integer computations. Right? We're only tracking uh, floating point operations that end up flowing to outputs. Um, and even then, and sometimes in the worst case, we get like 1,000x overhead. Uh, the other thing that's uh, really tricky is that it turns out when you're analyzing the assembly for an application, uh, there are many things that don't correspond to high level real operations. So for example, if you jump into a libm implementation and all of a sudden you're XORing floating point numbers with weird bit constants, it's unclear how to express that back to the user in terms of real operations, right? So we intercept library calls uh, and uh, represent those symbolically. We use a accurate implementation of those. Um, so they're sort of simulated. There's other things like uh, instead of storing zero into numbers, compilers XOR numbers with themselves. And uh, lastly, experts often do things like consummation or double-double tricks uh, to actually improve accuracy. The problem is that if you just have a naive implementation of the analysis I showed with Herbgrind, uh, you'll count those tricks as actually introducing error. Whereas, in fact, it turns out that they are eliminating error. So you need to be able to recognize these expert patterns, otherwise you're going to have a high false positive rate. So in two case studies, uh, one we looked at, at Gromax, and we actually identified a bug in the dihedral angle uh, computation in uh, Gromax, which was pretty exciting, and it's since been patched. Um, and we also looked at Jonathan Chuchuk's triangle implementation as an example of expert written code with a lot of handcrafted uh, compensations to address rounding error. Um, so Gromax was like 40,000 lines. Uh, we were able to run Herbrand on that, identify a bug. 
So while the overhead can be high, it's still useful in real practical settings for identifying root causes of rounding error. Triangle is expert written. Uh, if there was a library that was going to cause a lot of false positives, uh, Triangle would be a good example. But our mitigation of identifying these expert tricks for compensation were effective and reduced like the false positive rate by 95%. I think at the end we had like four or five false positives for all of Triangle. So uh, that was pretty exciting. Okay, tool one. I know that was quick. Uh, are there any quick questions about Herb Grind? Yes. Uh, how do you manage loops? loops? I mean, it's a dynamic analysis, so we just follow the control flow. Now, one one concern in general with branches. Oh, I think that they want you to have a mic. Yeah, so you're worried that the expression size is going to blow up. Absolutely, it does. That's why we have to bound. That's why we have to bound the expression size. Yeah, so everybody follow that? It's like, hey, I said I'm symbolically constructing the expression for every value. What happens when I have a loop? That expression is going to blow up. It's going to be enormous. Uh, so one of the key things is actually bounding the size. Um, there are some explicit tricks for loops. You can basically represent them like a regular expression. So you can still get some notion of a repeated operation without having the, the full expression size. Um, but in general, we just drop the leaves once an expression gets too big. That's a great question. OK, tool one down. Oops, no, 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 not yet. Tool two, yes. Uh, just a quick question. Um, why did you choose uh, Valgrind as a uh, <laughs> instead of maybe like Pin or some other dynamic? Yeah, we tools? chose Valgrind because the student hacking on it had experience with Vex. Oh, okay. And um, I regret it. No, I just think uh, <laughs> the Pin seems to be a more logical choice, lower overhead, um, yep. easier to use. Okay, yeah, just yeah. checking. Yeah. Uh, I think that for evaluating the, the overall analysis technique, Valgrind was fine. I think that for practical application, Pin would have been a, we'd get lower overhead. But, but I think the, out, I mean, the conceptual contributions remain the same. OK, great. Now, what can we do? We can take an arbitrary binary program, tell the user, this is the error you have in your output. Here's what you should look in your code to make changes. But again, remember, we're thinking about scientists who are not numerical methods experts. What change are they going to make? Right? If we give them back the quadratic equation, they're going to look at it and say, I learned the quadratic equation my whole life. Right? That's just how you do it. Right? There's like, what am I supposed to do with this instead? This is what I have on Wikipedia. Why should I do anything different in Flow? Well, the reason you should do something different in Flow is that it turns out that the quadratic equation can actually have really bad error. So here, um, by error, I'm going to talk about log of alts. Uh, I might say bits of error, roughly. Later on in the talk, we're gonna, we, we've changed using uh, decimals of accuracy inspired by John. So later on in the talk, you'll, you'll see that shift. But for now, we're going to do log of alts. Uh, and it turns out that if you plot the error of the quadratic equation with respect to b, sampling for a lot of different values of a and c, actually things can get really bad. Remember, this is log scale. And at the top there is 64 bits of error, which means you don't get the sign right. right? Like, it's completely gone off the rails. So what happens? How does quadratic go wrong? Well, basically, there's four different regimes uh, where there's four different kinds of, of problems that you experience when you're trying to compute quadratic. So here in the first in A, what's going on is we're getting overflow, right? When B, it's very, very, very negative, very, you know, at the bottom end of the, the range, it overflows, so you don't get a, a correct answer at all. It turns out that if you replace quadratic with this uh, interesting difference of uh, ratios, you're going to get a better answer. And we'll see how much better here in a little bit. Uh, here in the middle, remember this is log scale. So here in the middle in this B regime, things are actually pretty good. Uh, here in the C regime, we're getting into a situation where when B is large and A and C are small, then the square root of B squared minus 4AC is pretty close to B, and we get catastrophic cancellation from that subtraction. And in this case, we need to do uh, a trick that's similar to what Bill showed earlier in his sinking point talk which is do some algebraic rearrangement to compute this differently to avoid that catastrophic cancellation. And in the D regime, we have the same problem, overflow again, uh, but it's when B is very positive, and so we need to compute a slightly different expression. Now, I don't know about you, but before I'd ever seen any floating point stuff, computing things the way they are on the right here uh, is not something that I would ever think of. But it turns out if you do this and sample a large number of A and C values uh, and plot the error with respect to B, you get much better error behavior. 
And so what we wanted to do is be able to give regular scientists this sort of capability to push a button and get improved expressions out for their floating point code. So we built this tool called Herbie. Uh, we published in PLDI a few years ago. And I want to do a sort of a, a quick survey of how Herbie works. So Herbie has this pipeline uh, where we start off with some expression over the reels. Uh, and we want to transform it into something uh, which is close to, as close as possible to equivalent over the floats. So to start off with, we're going to take the expression and just run it naively on uh, floats and see what happens. And to do that, we're going to sample from the domain of the expression and compute in two different ways. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is compute over the reels and round. And we do this, we actually have an MPFR-based uh, interval library, which is guaranteed to be sound. Uh, it actually subsumes the techniques that were in the original paper. Um, and then we additionally sort of compute it in normal floating point. Now, one thing that was important here, of course, is that we sample uniformly on the representation of the floats to ensure good coverage. Um, so you flip bits, 64 bits, right, to pick uh, which floats you're going to use as inputs. But once we have this, we know uh, for the input expression which parts of the input domain it has high error on. Okay, so now we know, you know where the expression overall has high error, but we don't know where in the expression uh, that error is introduced. So the first thing we're going to do is try to focus uh, our efforts for improving the expression using that same local error trick that I talked about in Herbert. In particular, we're going to take the expression, we're going to start uh, at the bottom with float and high precision MPFR values, work up for every operand, we're going to uh, give it its sort of ground truth accurate inputs, uh, and then round it, versus computing that same operation in uh, reals, and then rounding, compare the difference. If it's large, then we're going to flag that, oper that operator as likely introducing error into the expression. And so in this case, we're going to flag the addition uh, in the numerator, um, because that's where cancellation can occur. And we're also going to flag uh, the, the square root, because we get problems uh, under it from the overflow. OK. The next thing we're going to do, now that we've sort of taken this expression over the reals and identified you know, you know, which inputs it has high error on, we know which parts of the expression are responsible for introducing the error, we want to try to find other ways of computing it that might be more accurate. And for that, uh, we have a few different techniques. Uh, so the first is we have just a large database of rewrites. And what we're going to do is we're going to look through our database and try to find rewrites that apply to the operations that we flagged as likely uh, introducing error. So uh, you know, there's a, a bunch of algebraic rules, some geometric stuff, et cetera. Uh, in this case, maybe we can apply uh, you know, this transformation. We're going to pattern match around the operand. If it doesn't directly match, we can use backwards chaining to find a sequence of rewrites that allow it to match. Uh, but once we find a, a substitution, then we rewrite it to get a different version of the expression. Now, uh, in this case, this is going to eventually allow us to avoid catastrophic cancellation. But often, just applying the rewrite is not sufficient. You'll notice there are more floating point operations in the rewritten version. And as a rough rule of thumb heuristic, the more floating point operations you do, the more rounding you incur. So uh, you can imagine this is not a, a winning strategy. Um, but we have a few, more, a few more tricks up our sleeves. So the first is uh, performing simplification of the real expression. And uh, in this case, you know, after we've done this rewrite to avoid the, the cancellation, we do simplification. We come up uh, with the version we saw for the C regime earlier when we started talking about Herbie. Um, now, this is easy to show you know, in like sort of four easy steps on the slide. But it actually turns out taking arbitrary real expressions and finding uh, simplifications for it is a really hard problem. Uh, in various generalizations of it, you can show it's you know, theoretically extremely difficult. It's also very difficult in practice. Uh, in particular, one of the things you want to avoid is undoing the rewrite you just applied. Right? We just rewrote it to avoid some problem. Now I'm going to simplify it. I don't want to undo the, the thing. So, uh, so there's a lot of care that has to be taken with this code. Uh, in particular, we apply some classic techniques developed for S&T solvers, uh, e-graphs, that allow us to represent a large number of possible rewrite candidates and then select the cheapest option from that space. Okay. So now we've seen rewriting, we've seen simplification. Uh, another, uh, one of the, another key trick in Herbie's arsenal is taking series expansions. So we can take uh, series expansions for uh, real expressions that Herbie supports, and this is how we get those weird fractions that we saw uh, when we first started talking about Herbie earlier. Right? So in this case, when b is positive, uh, I can take the expansion of the square root. 
um, and simplify down to this fraction, right? So that's where those weird fractions were coming in, is when you take the series expansion and add simplification to the mix, you get these approximations that work for certain parts of the uh, input domain of the program. So now we've gone through and we've generated a bunch of different ways for computing, uh, you know, alternate ways of computing this real expression. And we're going to keep the, the good candidates uh, each time we go through this loop, that is, the candidates that are best at at least one input point. And then what we need to do once we're done, remember, at the end we produced one expression that had branch points. It knew sort of which part of the input regime was the, the best place to use uh, the different flavors of the expression. So now we have to somehow combine all those good candidates into one single expression. Uh, and the way to think about that, you know, we sort of take all the candidates, we line them up, we sort of overlay uh, their error graphs on each other, and then what we want to do, of course, is just walk on the bottom, right? And so we developed a dynamic programming technique that does exactly that to discover uh, the right branch points. And we tried this with respect to uh, each variable individually. We select the one that reduces uh, overall error. And uh, doing this, we're actually able to solve uh, a bunch of classic problems from numerical methods textbooks. Uh, our favorite examples come from Hamming's book on numerical methods for scientists and engineers. So we took every example from his chapter on rearranging floating point expressions to avoid rounding error uh, and are able to improve them in this graph the uh, heavy arrows left is the average accuracy for the original version of an expression, and the right-hand side uh, shows the accuracy after Herbie has improved it. And you can see that in some cases, uh, Herbie's able to provide very dramatic improvement. Um, so we've been developing Herbie for several years now. There's a lot of places that are using it day to day. Uh, they say really nice things, which makes us feel warm and fuzzy. My favorite is that there's now code that Herbie helped improve doing something on Jupiter studying the magnetosphere, I don't know, but uh, yeah, so it's been a, a lot of fun connecting with a bunch of folks who are using this to address rounding errors that stump them. Okay, tool two. How are we doing? Okay, great, yeah, I think we're, we're, we're about on pace. So any questions about Herbie? Okay, so now you should, should start to see um, some potential connections. Right? We ran Herbgrind on some arbitrary binary. It spit out some expression that was responsible for introducing error in the output. And we had another tool, Herbie, which takes an expression and comes up with an alternate way of computing it. So ideally, we'd like to be able to put things like that together. Um, but before we go into the, the nuts and bolts of how that works, I wanted to sort of take a step back and talk about uh, slightly bigger picture issues. So across numerics, there are a couple of problems. Uh, one is with building pipelines of tools, and the other is with yardsticks, with measurements. Uh, so if you go look at, at least sort of on the programming languages side, uh, you know, for several years, uh, you know, people have been increasingly interested in numerics, and for several years, every paper invents its own new benchmark suite and uses its own slightly different, slightly incompatible definitions of how to measure error, right, when you're trying to improve it. Um, and this leads to a lot of problems with, with uh, trying to have apples apples comparisons. Of course, you know, uh, Freud saw this kind of thing in humans a long time ago. In his classic Civilizations and His Discontents, he talks about how people invent metrics that serve them. Uh, what's less known is uh, Sigmund's uh, you know, twin, Sigmoid Efround, who noticed that this is also true for numerics. It's not a real quote. My students warned me that it wasn't very funny, but I thought I'd try it. Anyway, so uh, one of the things we want, right, is we want standard benchmark suites, we want standard error measures, we want to be able to do reproducible apples to apples comparisons across tools. Another thing we want is the ability to compose tools. So over the last several years, people are building more and more floating point tools, but again, they're all inventing their own uh, you know, format for how do you describe a floating point computation. Right? Uh, how do you describe its input? How do you specify the error behavior you want for it? And what that means is that you know, even though these tools are addressing different stages of development, in principle I should be able to connect their inputs and outputs and build powerful pipelines by composing tools. I can't do it because none of them speak the same language. Right? So I want to be able to do apples to apples comparisons and I want to be able to compose tools to build pipelines and not just pipelines of tools written by the same group. Right? I don't just want to put together Herbie and Herbgrind. I want to be able to compose tools written by 
you know, people who've never met each other and just have those things click together and work like Legos. Okay, so uh, you know, this is not a new problem. It turns out that other areas of computer science have had this challenge and addressed it in remarkably similar ways. And so uh, in you know, compilers and architecture, there's the spec benchmark suite. Many architects use this when designing new chips. All compiler hackers, at least C compiler hackers, use this when they're implementing new optimizations, right? Uh, there are examples from the automated theorem proving community, right? They define a standard. Uh, people who are reducing verification problems to automated theorem proving use that to you know, compete on different reductions. People implementing automated theorem provers support that interface and try to improve performance. We see similar things in synthesis. And what's important is that this interface enables independent progress on both sides of the interface. Right? So I'm not stuck waiting for either a client to update or you know, as a client, I'm not stuck waiting for somebody who's building a tool to fix something. I have a, a single stable interface um, that I can rely on. So the goal of FP Bench is to try to work toward addressing these problems for the area of uh, numerical tools. And uh, to do that, we provide uh, some formats for specifying floating point computations, uh, some tools for operating over FP bench, uh, benchmarks, uh, as well as a benchmark suite for small kernels uh, where numerical accuracy is important. Uh, so I wanted to show a couple of examples of one of the key points here, which is composing tools, right? How do we put Herbie and Herbgren together? We can use this standard format from FP Bench. So uh, when we last left the plotter, right? Remember we saw that bad rounding error and stippling. Uh, we had run Herbgrind and we got an expression out that was responsible for introducing error in the output. And uh, here what we've done is we've taken that expression from Herbgrind, we've plugged it into Herbie, and Pavel is now running. And I think I'm gonna have to click one more time and see if that makes it go. There we go, okay. So uh, Herbie just spit back a complex, uh, a, a complicated expression, which is like what we saw it do with quadratic earlier in the Herbie slides. And now Pavel's using tools from FP Bench to take the Herbie output and translate it back into a C program so the user can plug it into their original code and uh, get the improvements provided by Herbie. And so you know it's important to have these tools that allow you not only to have different floating point tools work together, but also allow the user to convert to and out of that format so they can uh, make changes directly uh, in their program. So here, Pavel uh, put the improved version back in. You notice only, uh, only over a single variable. Uh, Herb Grind, or Herbie noticed that um, A and C were always fixed in the original program. When we compile and run the updated version, sure enough, we don't have any more NANDs, and the pattern with the exponents has been fixed. Right? So here's an end-to-end -end example. Somebody has a buggy C program. They run it under Herbgrind. Herbgrind says, look, this expression is responsible for introducing rounding error in your output. You take that expression straight from Herbgrind, hand it to Herbie. Herbie turns on it, spits out. Herbie says, this is a more accurate way to compute this as best I can tell. You take that result, convert it back to C, put it in the program, you run it, and uh, you know, the error is largely mitigated. Um, but as I said earlier, right, this is not super compelling if FP Bench is just a format where the group at UW uses it to connect its own tools. So we've also been working with other groups uh, to make you know, cross-group tool compositions. So our friends at MPI uh, work on this tool called DAISY, which is a sound error analysis for floating points. So it establishes uh, worst case error bounds for small uh, you know, accuracy sensitive kernels. Um, and so we looked at how we can combine uh, DAISY and Herbie profitably. In particular, remember, Herbie's based on sample. So it's an unsound heuristic tool that's best effort for improving accuracy. Whereas DAISY is a sound static analysis. It makes provable guarantees about the worst case error behavior of your floating point code. By putting them together, uh, you know, one way to look at it is that now you can get sound guarantees about Herbie's improvements. Uh, it also turns out that when you make code more accurate, it's easier to prove that it's accurate. And so this also corresponds to speeding up DAISY. By improving the accuracy of a program, uh, Daisy is more quickly able to find a proof. So there's a, a video also of, of putting these two, two tools together. Um, I think I'm gonna go ahead and hop over it. So you sort of have the high level idea based on the Herbie Herbrand example. Uh, but if you have time at the end and people are curious, you can pop back to this as well. 
Okay, so SPBench is this interchange format. We want to have standard metrics, we want to have a standard format, we want to be able to compose tools. Um, and so at a high level, you phrase uh, an example benchmark or a computation in the FP core format, which as I mentioned earlier is an S expression. Uh, it can be accompanied by a bunch of metadata, uh, including like the source of this computation, you know, what paper it came from, what benchmark suite it's part of, what features it uses. Uh, and we can give it a specification, so accuracy of the result or preconditions about what inputs, uh, you know, the domain of this expression uh, are. And then we actually get the computation, which is just some pure expression over reals, right? So this is just a real expression with basic arithmetic operators. Uh, now it turns out that you can actually express quite a bit uh, just as pure computations. In particular, it can include things like while loops, right? So we have a list, like a common list style while loop expression. Uh, so we can get iteration. We support basically all of the BIM as well as some other operations. Um, but using, yeah, and, and additionally, one of the things we're most excited about, inspired by uh, the topics that people are exploring here is that you can use sort of arbitrary number formats in FPBench uh, expressions. Um, so, you know, here we've got a couple of 32 bit. We have mixed uh, precision arithmetic with 128 bit. Uh, later on in the talk, we'll see some examples of playing around with these parameters in the number system. So you can literally just go in and tweak it and specify a completely different number system. Now, uh, because it's all S expression based, if you try to encode something larger, and more complicated. Uh, sometimes the code gets pretty verbose and unreadable, um, but there are additional formats that allow you to write these more concisely, providing sugar for sort of imperative-like languages. Um, and you know, it's not too far uh, a cry from just writing it up in C. Uh, if you get used to S expressions, it's pretty readable. Um, there's a bunch of tools for operating over these things. In particular, we can compile uh, FP core expressions to C, Scala, JavaScript, Z3, Wolfram, there might be a couple more, but uh, basically we can generate code in many languages from these kernels, uh, and we've diff tested them against each other to ensure that we get the same behavior across different backends, which gives us a lot of confidence in those compilers. There's now about, actually there's like about 120 uh, benchmarks that we've taken from recent papers in the numerical tools uh, literature. Uh, so now people, are, instead of rolling their own benchmark suite every time they try to write a paper, are pulling down the uh, FPBench suite and then contributing back to it. Because of course their tool does really well on something that nobody else has evaluated on and they want that to be in the suite and so it, it keeps growing over time. Um, and so you know, we found a bunch of overlap. Uh, we found you know, things are usually pretty reproducible based on past results, um, but we're pretty excited for this to be cleaned up one use case that we didn't expect is this has actually been used in several courses uh, where students are doing projects that are uh, related to numerics. That's been exciting. So here's a quick video just showing uh, the FPBench standard. Uh, if you sort of scroll through all this, you can go check it out online right now. Uh, the specs are all online. Give you the full syntax, uh, definitions for the error, etc. I want to jump a little bit ahead. Can you jump like 30 seconds in? Yeah. Little, these are error metrics. A little bit. Yeah, great, perfect. And uh, what's really nice is that the benchmarks are all online. Um, so you can go and look at these. There's about 120. Uh, you can scroll through them. Again, these are small numerical kernels that people have taken from either automated improvement or from uh, trying to soundly verify worst case error bounds. Uh, you can search through them. So if we look at for example, an arc length example taken from uh, one of Jim Dimmel's papers on uh, mixed precision tuning. Uh, we see that we can capture that mixed precision, uh, those, those operations that mix different formats. Uh, there are other example benchmarks. It's taken from the Precomonius paper in 2013. Um, you know, we can look at the complex root example uh, that we've been sort of talking about. What's nice is you can immediately send it to different tools. So you can just click on Herbie. It'll send that benchmark to Herbie and run it in the browser. You can also send it to Titanic. We'll come back to this in a second. It's loading. Uh, you can also send it to Titanic, which we'll see uh, a little bit of next. And you can search through the benchmarks uh, based on some domain. So here we have a bunch of things from you know, Doppler shifts to pendulum swinging to in-body simulations. Um, 
And again, what's nice is that people working on new numerical tools can just take these and run with them to evaluate their tool and provides apples to apples comparisons as well as comp composition. I just wanted to quickly show, uh, you know, when you click on that Herbie link after it loads, you get this full report, which shows the original expression as well as uh, what it was expanded to. Um, what's nice is you get a derivation. You get these sort of error graphs that show with respect to different variables uh, what the error looks like before red and after improved in blue. Uh, and you get some derivation that shows why Herbie did what it did. You know, why does it think this complex expression is going to be more accurate, sort of justifies each of those steps, as well as a breakdown of where Herbie spent its time analyzing uh, your code. Okay, so that's FP Bench. Um, it's kind of hard to make a really riveting section of a talk about a benchmark standard format, but uh, we actually are really excited. A bunch of our best interactions with the community have come through people contributing uh, to this benchmark suite and building tools that work with it. So uh, one takeaway from this talk from us is that we would really like for everyone here to start using FP Bench or just kick the tires and let us know what doesn't work for you. Uh, we're very responsive to issues filed on GitHub and uh, of course we welcome pull requests. So if you want to you know, contribute, uh, it, would be, it would be great. Okay, any questions about Herbie or FP Bench? Yes? Thank you. Uh, in our team, we are also developing a, a compiler which is able to support a variable precision for triple format, uh, which has several parameters. But how this new data type could be like uh, uh, added to these previous tools? So, sorry, is the question how could we add the variable precision type new data to type. Yeah, new data type, which has a different memory yeah, format, like U, Composite, whatever. Yeah, I believe that we can do that. We actually haven't thought about uh, non-fixed formats carefully, so the spec doesn't cover that yet. But we would be very interested in doing that, and I don't think there's any fundamental reason we couldn't do it. Uh, I'm, I'm quite confident, especially based on Bill and David's aggressive nodding, that that is something we can do. Okay, but... Uh, we haven't done it yet, so, okay. so we, uh, we would love to chat about adding that. Okay. How do you uh, escape the, the curse of dimensionality uh -huh. if you have many variables, for yeah. you like your sampling, and then you are exploring the, the rewriting? So it's, Great question. It doesn't sound good. Uh, it is not good. So uh, I think that what has been surprising to us is that it works even up to, so Herbie works pretty darn well up to five or six variables, uh, which has been, which was quite surprising to us. Uh, so basically sampling seems to uncover even up to five and six D, uh, rounding error pretty reliably. So we've done a bunch of experiments, you know, varying seeds and things, and Herbie still reliably discovers the same uh, sort of root causes of error and fixes it in the same way. Uh, but once you go past six, maybe seven, you go up to eight, nine variables, the, you're, you're, it's just too unlikely to, to hit those parts of the space. Um, so one thing we've thought about, uh, one of the things that's nice about the Herbie pipeline is that, that um, focus step is really just one part of the pipeline. And all we need to do, like sampling, what's important is that it tells us where we need to focus. So you could remove that one component from the Herbie pipeline and put in other error analysis techniques that are able to handle higher dimensional examples. Um, in particular, this comes up when you start doing linear algebra. So if you just model matrices as a bunch of variables, it's very high dimension. And so uh, that's, that's absolutely a, a limitation right now. Um, but because Herbie's design is modular, if something better comes along, we can just slot it in, and all the other components will still just work. Um, great question. Uh, so, so perhaps you already answered the question I have, which is the the number format is not a uh, a value of a type in the language you've developed. Yeah. So an FB bench. Uh, each operation is carried out in reals and then rounded based on its context. So we're actually going to see a bunch of examples of that. So this is a perfect, like, I, I gather that there's a, in this sport basketball, there's a move called an alley-oop, where one player throws the ball and the other one slam dunks it. So I feel like you've thrown the ball up. Now, I don't know if I'm gonna, about to slam dunk it or not, but your question about how does this work when you have these sort of mixed types, these arbitrary precisions, is exactly what the next section is about. Unless I just misread the question. Uh, 
yes, I think you would want to explore over multiple number formats. So that's what you're going to do. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, great. I, I think it's an alley -oop. I'll do my best to, to slam dunk it. Okay, tool number four, Titanic. Okay, so, uh, you know, we saw that in FP Bench, you can have, uh, you know, sort of arbitrary variants of different number systems, right? So what happens if I have some weirdo float uh, format where I have like five bits of exponent and eight bits of mantis? I think this is something we saw earlier with uh, the, the climate models, right? Or I can do, you know, 16-bit posit, or maybe I do fixed point, right? A user can put in whatever they want here. Uh, so how are we going to evaluate that? Because I don't have implementations of every variant, every possible variant of posits laying around, every possible variant of fixed point laying around, every possible variant of float laying around. Uh, so uh, Bill has built this uh, tool where we can take uh, FP bench benchmarks and evaluate uh, them under sort of any number system. So here we're going to go uh, back to our benchmarks in FP bench. We're going to jump down to that uh, positive quadratic root we've been talking so much about so far. And here, instead of sending it to Herbie, we're actually going to send it to this tool, Titanic. So this is the quadratic again. Uh, here, we're, we're going to the Titanic tool. It's going to pop up here. And we see that we have uh, the, the quadratic on the left. And on the right, we have this sort of control panel. And we can do a bunch of different stuff with that. Uh, in particular, here, we're evaluating under a floating point. We can specify the inputs to quadratic. So here, we're looking at 2, uh, you know, uh, 10, 6, and 3. We're going to run this. And we get some answer back. It turns out this answer is actually fine. Um, we can do the same thing with posits. And when we evaluate uh, the quadratic with posits, we get a pretty similar answer. I think it's actually slightly more accurate. Um, and we can start, you know, we're gonna switch back here to float. We can start bumping up that B value, right? So we're gonna start multiplying it by 10 and see what happens. Uh, remember when we ran the C code, there was some pattern in the exponents that stopped happening. So here we, we bump it up to eight, we're gonna bump it up again to nine under floats, and all of a sudden we get zero, which is just wrong, right? Uh, so in this case, I think we, I forget exactly what the, the root cause was, uh, Herbie would tell us. What's interesting though, is that if we go just use posits, do nothing else, we get a much more accurate answer, right? Just out of the box. Um, so that's pretty cool. So Titanic allows us to uh, play around with the number system that we want to use and see what examples do under different, different number systems, right? We can play with inputs, we can change the number system, we can sort of explore that space to get a feel for how giving computation behaves. Uh, so a really instructive example, though, is actually uh, John's 32-bit accuracy challenge. So I don't know if folks have seen this, but this is just a constant expression. And uh, John threw down the gauntlet and said, you know, do your worst. How, how well can you do with IEEE 754 if you only have 32 bits? Uh, or any other number system, right? And uh, it turns out that this is a, a pretty hard thing to do well. Here on the right, we see the uh, FB core expression for it. But let's send this to Titanic and, and see what happens. So uh, here we have 32-bit, uh, we have the, you know, the, the, we have John's challenge. Uh, we have the correct answer up here annotated in the metadata at the top. And uh, we're gonna start with a normal 32-bit. And we just run it with floating point, uh, we get this answer, you know, it's not super accurate, but what's cool is we can just change the floating point format, right? So we just change the exponent, we change the mantissa, we run it again with a click, and we get a little bit better answer. We can also uh, jump to posits, and here we're gonna not do the override. Um, so if we run it under posits uh, with one exponent, or sorry, with two exponent bits and 32-bit, we evaluate it, uh, we get an answer which is slightly better, if we do it with one exponent bit, it actually gets even better. In fact, this is darn close, and I think this was the one that you were showing. Um, so this is really close to the right answer, which is pretty cool, right? So again, another example where posits are, are crushing it, very exciting. Um, what's interesting is that if you, you know, once you have Titanic, you can start doing experiments that you know, allow you to explore over number systems. So this is uh, with IEEE 754 32-bit varying the number of exponents, and it's, it's kind of weird, so if you have a bunch of uh, exponents, you're gonna get six decimals of accuracy. Uh, posits do seven something, I think. We'll see that on the, the next slide. One thing that I still can't get over is, I don't know if folks see this, like for some reason, at 15 exponent bits, it does better than the surrounding number formats. It's just none of these like weird floating point things, like you avoid some cancellation somehow. But what's nice is that we can, you know, with Titanic, we can survey this. Um, 
What's actually also interesting, so yeah, posits do seven uh, uh, and uh, five hundredths uh, decimals of accuracy. You can also, you know, you don't have to do uniform uh, precision throughout a computation. You can actually vary the number system per operation. So it turns out that if you arbitrarily vary the floating point format per operation, you can actually do a little bit better than posits. Now, this is an unfair experiment because we haven't done the same varying with posits for every sub expression, but it's something we could pretty easily do uh, with Titanic. Um, but by doing this mixed precision, you can actually sort of figure out uh, what the best way to compute some small kernel is. Um, so Titanic gives us this way to explore arbitrary number systems. Um, and it's really easy to actually add a new system. Uh, essentially, the high level idea is exactly what we saw on the first slide of the talk. Right? What does floating point do? Well, it's like you compute in reals and then you round. So what Titanic does is it computes everything in reals and then all it needs for each uh, number system are the rounding rules. I think it'd be very interesting to compare with NumRep and you know, potentially integrate this stuff. I think it's probably even easier if we just use the, the, uh, your sort of generators. Um, so I'd be really interested in sort of looking at these connections. Um, but that said, you know, uh, even you know, just having to specify the rounding mode for a new number system, uh, yesterday, uh, Bill and David and I sat down over coffee and Bill added a uh, sinking point for uh, <coughs> posits to Titanic in like 30 minutes. Uh, so it can be quite easy to extend this with new number systems. You get this whole web interface for exploring stuff and you can send your colleagues examples to play with, uh, which is a lot of fun. So okay, so that was sort of the fourth tool. Uh, I just wanted to mention a couple things. We already had a question about the cursor dimensionality. Um, there's uh, some other stuff that, that we want to look into adding. One thing that I'm really excited about that I think a lot of people here are thinking is, you know, what happens when we live in a world that isn't under sort of the uh, iron rule of IEEE 754? What happens when there's actual diversity in number systems, right? When people are trying new things and experimenting and thinking. So one thing is that a lot of code is specialized to the number system. And I don't want to have to maintain seven versions of my program to get accuracy for whatever number system I happen to be running on. So one thing we've been thinking about is, can you use Herbie to figure out how to adapt your code to different number systems? So in the climate example, we saw that you have to figure out the scaling factor, depending on you know, what regime you're operating in. We think that's the kind of thing Herbie should be able to do for you, right? So you still write your code conceptually as close to reals uh, as you can. If you're lucky enough to be running on posits, Herbie has an easy job adapting your code for you. If you're stuck running on some weird IEEE 754 variant, maybe it's harder, but you don't have to manually by hand maintain eight versions of your code. So David has been hacking on this. Uh, you know, he added posit support to Herbie over the past few months. And uh, we have some initial early results, which are pretty interesting. Um, it's unclear to us so far to what degree these are reflections about Herbie versus reflections about number systems. But it turns out that if you uh, run Herbie on double, single, and 16-bit uh, posits, this is 16-bit posits, 16-bit posits, uh, some interesting stuff happens. In particular, it's not always the case that the improvement Herbie finds for a given number system is better than the improvement that Herbie finds for a different number system. So sometimes the best, the most accurate way Herbie can find to compute in double might be via rewrites it found by studying posits and vice versa. Uh, so this is sort of surprising. It seems like there is no one best way to adapt code to a particular number system. Um, but there's also still, I think, a bunch to learn here. Uh, yeah. Uh, and there's also a, a lot we still like to add to, you know, Herbie, Herbrine, and FB Bench as well. Um, you know, being able to handle things like vectors and matrices would be extremely interesting uh, for doing these sorts of automated improvements. We, of course, uh, you know, we'd like to build up more tools for reproducibility so that when somebody publishes a paper with a new tool, you can press a button and you can rerun their, all of their uh, experiments. Um, we'd like to look at more intergroup uh, composition of tools. Um, and I think one of the other really exciting things people in this room are well positioned to do is to set challenge problems. So we'd love to have a section of the FB Bench website, which are, you know, these are things that automated tools should be able to handle so that, uh, you know, normal scientists doing their day jobs don't have to worry about the fine details of numerics. Okay, with that, uh, are there any questions about the tools? <coughs>
uh, where would where do you hope to be five or ten years from now? What what is the long term perspective on what this should do? Yeah, I. I I don't know, because I think there's still a lot uh, left to figure out. Uh, I think one thing I would like would, so here's the dream, right? You tell me your number system, and I will automatically produce for you a full software stack. I'll give you an accurate libm implementation. I'll give you an accurate blas implementation. I'll give you an accurate lapac implementation. I'll give you an accurate uh, GNU scientific library implementation. You know, And I'll be able to incorporate the synthesis of that entire infrastructure into analysis of your application code as well. You know, maybe even, yeah, I think it'd be also incredibly interesting to look at the connection to accelerators for that number system. But what I want is I want to be able to push a button and get accurate implementations so that people writing applications just think in terms of real numbers, but they get fast, correct output. That's, I mean, so I don't know if that's 10 years, right? I think maybe like five years is we can do libm. Because libm is really hard, right? Um, and, and matrices, and tensors. And tensors, yeah. Thanks, Bill. Yeah. It's it's more an answer to the previous question uh, for for you. There, there's one uh, field where what you showed is really would be really useful. Is FPGA uh, compilations so or combining a, a problem to one to FPGA? Because on FPGA, you really have the, the flexibility to choose different normal formats for different points of the computation and to, to really dimension every, everything. And so I've been, in, I've spent 10 years uh, designing these flexible operators and nobody uses them. So I have 30 point units which, which can be, you can choose the exponent size and, the, and it's hardware. And yeah. uh, people who use my library, they just use single and double precision because that's what they're used to. And that's because are, it's conservatism and it's normal. Uh, they want the same result as the software. So if, if they could have something that helps them choose which, which precision is good for each point of the program, that, that, that's really a great value to, to, add to the FPGA compilation uh, kind of uh, Yeah, we would, we would love to actually get some benchmarks that we could use to show your potential users and show this off and also help us flesh uh, out more of the Titanic use cases. Um, yeah, that would be great. We should, we should chat afterwards and, and share information. All right, folks, thanks very much.